But today you're in big church, and we're going to break this down. I know it's a simple phrase, let your light shine, but we're going to break this down, and we're going to talk about just how important shining this light is. But first, you know, what is light? You know, it, it's pretty simple, but it can be a little more complicated. Light is electromagnetic radiation that can be perceived, perceived with the human eye. That's light. Now, there's other types of light, invisible light and whatnot, but I'm talking about the light you can see. And the, and the main characteristic of light is that you can see it. It's perceivable. You don't hear light. You see light. And we're talking about letting your light shine. And I hope you'll pick up on that. We're talking about shining the light of Jesus through our life so that people on the receiving end can see with their own eyes Jesus, can see with their own eyes God in the flesh. Before I get started, I do want to open up this story. When we were moving here from Abita Springs, we built a house. We lived in it for two years, and we sold it almost to the day of when we moved into it. Two years after we moved in, we were closing on it to sell. And it was just woods. When, we, when I obtained this property, I did some uh, consolidating of some different parcels of land. And it was all woods, got it cleared. Six months from start, six months later, we were moving in. Well, there was a guy that lived on the backside of this little wooded property that was kind of a recluse a little bit. And an older gentleman, didn't really see him very much. But when we came in and started knocking down trees and all of that, he was very particular. He was like, leave these trees on the property line. You know, I don't want to see you. You know what I mean? He he wanted his space, right? So we did all of that. We worked very well with him. I, in my mind, we worked very well with him. And we move in, and everything's good. I don't think there's a problem in the world. Until one day, I find out there is a problem. Because the fire department shows up. Because there's a line in the yard. A charter cable line was laying in the grass. They were coming to dig it and tuck it in the dirt. But he called them to come out. Well, when the fire department comes out, the firefighter comes over to me. He's like, do you know about this guy that lives next door to you? I'm like, Mr. Rich, he's great. I, I love Mr. Rich. He's like, he's got it out for you. And I was like, really? I didn't even know. I thought everything was great. And then one thing led to another. I'm thinking, I want to come make peace with this guy. I'm going to talk to him. Boy, that opened up a whole can. I realized just how much vitriol this guy had in his heart toward me. I mean, the police came out. He called the police on us because it was just like we wouldn't we weren't doing anything. We didn't we weren't provoking. We weren't anything like that. We want peace. I've never had a problem with any of my neighbors. So it just kept snowballing, man. Even Rachel, it disturbed her so much. She wanted to try to say something to be a peacemaker. And he just lashed out at her. I mean, totally disrespectful. And y'all know Rachel. She's an angel. Totally disrespectful. I'm like, what is going on? So my daughter, Emery, she was six at the time. She said that we had these little gift bags for evangelism to give out in the neighborhoods. I want to bring Mr. Richard bag. I'm like, well, I don't know if that's a great idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... You're cute and all, and he might even take it from you, but I don't know about that. I was like, but you know what? Let's wait till Christmas. Christmas was right around the corner, and I tell you what, we'll, give, we'll get him a gift. I didn't want to come with like, hey, come to church, but you know what? We'll just give him a gift and just show him that we don't have anything against you. Like, we love you. So I was doing some Christmas shopping, and I was at a little consignment shop, and they had these vinyl records in the store and i heard that he liked jazz music so i had the idea i don't even know if he has vinyl i don't know if he can play vinyl i don't know anything really but i said you know what i'm gonna get these three vinyl records get them to wrap it put a bow on it and i'm gonna go leave it by his door and just say god bless you which i did and 
Would you know? A few hours later, I got a text message on my phone. Totally thankful. Totally appreciative. Totally a completely different person. I could read you the text right now. It's still on my phone. And he was saying how wonderful it was and how he knows we can be friends now. And, man, I love jazz on vinyl. You, you didn't even know. And he was just heaping love on me. All because I bought him some vinyl. I bought him some jazz on vinyl. But I didn't let what was going on between us cause me to mistreat him. I never did mistreat him ever. Never disrespected him or anything like that. But as I just continued to just try to show the light of Christ, eventually Jesus himself broke through to him. And, and it changed the whole situation. It was very nice for us because we had this thing going on and I hate to leave something like that behind. Like I want closure, I want peace. Anywhere I leave, I want there to, this to be good and right. And thank God, as we were moving, that happened as we were leaving Abita Springs. So I just wanted to share a little story as a, as a representation, but we're gonna open up in the book of John Chapter 1, I'm going to read a little passage right here uh, talking about Christ coming into the world. It says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Hear that. He came to the world with unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the father's one and only son. This passage is talking about Jesus. He came in as the light of the world. In this passage, when that word light is presented from the Greek word, it means the manifestation of God's self-existent life. The manifestation of God's self-existent life. Manifestation means an event, action, or object that clearly shows or embodies something, especially a theory or an abstract idea. So something is manifested. It comes from the unseen realm into the seen realm. And remember, when we're talking about light, what is the characteristic of light? You see it. You can see it. So Jesus was here to embody God in the flesh. He was God in the flesh so that we could then see God with our own eyes. Jesus was the light of the world. But he's not here anymore. So where's the light of the world now? It's us. That same light, that same revealing that takes place, that took place from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has been passed down to you and I. Look at Matthew 5, 14 through 16. This is Jesus speaking. You are. Remember, this message is for who? You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. 
No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, the lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. God gave us this unbelievably high calling now to represent him, to shine the light of God just like Jesus did in the earth. That's an incredible high calling. And that can be intimidating. Because it's such a huge responsibility. Remember, the world is dark. They have no representation of God in the world. God's self-existent life isn't in the world. It's in heaven. It's in that unseen realm. But it's made manifest into a dark world which represents as light into a dark world his life is being deposited into this world his life it came through christ and now it's extended through us but that's the only hope that the world has of seeing it we are the only hope that this world this dark world has of seeing god Think about the people around you in your life. They're lost and going to hell. They're in darkness. And you are the hope and the light of the world to them. For them to see God. To have a chance of knowing him. To having a chance of being saved. That's, that's very important. So how do we shine this light? Remember, light, us being the light, is manifesting God to people so they can see him. So how do we show people God? How do we do that? We're going to look at three necessary steps that you have to have to shine the light of Christ to the world. This is how we reveal God to the world. The first thing is we have to actually have the true light ourselves. It's got to be the real deal, holy field. It's got to be. It can't be some fake form fashion. That ain't going to work. We got to have the actual light, the actual revelation of who God is manifested inside of our own heart. It sounds like common sense, but we can tell people about God. We can tell them how they should live. We can go around telling them what sin is and not actually have the light of God in us. That's possible. And it should kind of spook some of us that I can actually look the part to an extent, sound the part, and be missing the actual life from God. Look at Matthew 7, 22, uh, 22 through 23. This is Jesus speaking. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who breaks God's laws. You mean I can cast out a demon and God not know me? Yes. That's scary. How easy it would be for us to be fooled. To think I'm good. Everything's good here. I go to church. I told somebody about Jesus. Let me tell you who told somebody about Jesus. Me in the ballroom, putting down a Budweiser, not serving Jesus, not having the light of God in my life. I can remember specifically being at TJ Quills in New Orleans, sitting at the bar, <laughs> sitting at the bar with a guy that was reaching his end of the road, breaking down, life's a mess, terrible. And I'm just sitting here getting drunk partying. But I knew the truth. I knew it. And I knew he needed it. I knew I needed it too, but I was rejecting it because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Doesn't work like that. You can't get the light of God. You can't get God and keep you at the same time. I can't do what I want to do and expect God to come and live in my heart. Because he's either Lord of all 
or he's Lord of none. He doesn't do the half Lord thing. That doesn't work for an actual Lord. It's either his way or your way. His way leads to life. Your way leads to death. His way is life because he is life. He is a self-existent life source. He is the author of life. When we separate ourselves from him, we get the opposite of life. We get death. Eternal separation from God, eternal death. So we have to first receive the true light of God and receive his life in order to be able to shine. It, it, it just has to be that way. The second thing is we have to see and know what he looks like. How can we, how can we show something we don't know? We got to look and see what he looks like. And the first thing that we know about God is God is what? Love. God is love. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, through 4 through 7. This is God. Y'all ready? Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. If God is love, then and this is what love looks like, then this is what God looks like. Again, how are we going to show something that we don't know? We got to know what he looks like. We got to know what we need to be on display, what we need to be looking like if we have any hope of showing the world what God looks like. How about the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our life. What is fruit? It's evidence. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. If God through his Holy Spirit produces these things in our life, then this must also be what he's like. When he comes and lives in us and then we begin to display the evidence of him being in us, then this must be evidence of what he looks like and how he appears when he becomes seen. So, again, we can't show what we don't know. I can't show you something I don't know. I got to know what he looks like so I can then show you it. And lastly is we have to submit to his lordship. This is a biggie. I'm going to rest on this one. This is the heavy part. Y'all ready for this? Go ahead, put your little seatbelt on, you know, get yourself situated. I'm not going to yell at you, you know, but. This is so important. If we don't get this, then we don't get any of it. Because again, if he's not Lord of all, he's Lord of none. So we got, if we don't submit to his lordship in our life, he's not our Lord. So we got to determine if we're going to submit to his lordship. Imagine having a flashlight in the dark, but you refuse to turn it on. You just hold it and walk around in the dark with a flashlight in your hands. That's no good. But a lot of people that claim to be Christians, they walk around a dark world. And they're not shining the light that they have in their hand. We have to be committed to obeying him and imitating him. What does obeying him look like? Jesus just said it. Shine your light into all the world so that people can see your good deeds and give glory to God. That's what he's telling us to do. So step one, we got to be committed to turning on the light, to releasing our revelation of God and what we know about him to those around us. We got to be committed to that. That's got to be numero uno. Some Christians, they, they listen to this. This is the scary part. 
Some Christians are shining, but they're not shining God. They're revealing something, but they're not revealing God. Instead of patient, they're impatient. That's not okay. Instead of being kind, they're unkind. That's not okay. Instead of coming to save, we condemn. That's not okay. Instead of letting have someone else have their way, we demand our own way. Could be cutting in a line or road rage. And how about this? How about now that we got Thanksgiving coming up and Christmas coming up, and we're going to be around a lot of family in different environments like that, a lot of planning, coordinating, things like this. How about instead of complaining about the food and the time and this, that, and the other, how about instead being thankful and just ready to help in any way we can? This is what hit me so huge about family. Family knows you. <laughs> they know you. They've seen you your whole life. Strangers don't know you. If you come around a stranger shining Jesus, they could, at least at first, just think you're a really great person. Wow, they're so kind. They're so patient. They're so loving. Wow, I love Don Trell. He's great. Yeah, his name's Don Trell. I just met that guy. But how about your family that knew you when you weren't so kind and patient and things like that? And they know your triggers and they know your buttons and they had these histories and those histories. And all of these things about you, they know you. When they see God start to come out of you, now you're cooking. Now you, you're in, I keep saying this phrase, honey, you're in the money now. When you let God do that deep work in your heart and you decide that you're going to let Jesus come out of you, especially to those who are familiar with you, especially to those who trigger you the most, because there's so much comfort, there's so much familiarity, it's easy for you to just spout off and be however you want to be, because this is who I am. But when you determine, I'm not going to be who I was. I'm not going to shine who I was when I was in darkness. I'm not going to shine that darkness. I'm going to shine Jesus from here on out. Think about that. And if we don't commit to doing that, what happens when we go around with the big Christian label on our chest, shining something that's not him? That's false advertisement. That's a, actually a crime. It is, literally. False advertisement. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I go to the Tabernacle Church. But then we're shining something that is not God, and then we begin to give God a bad name. How about we start to give the Tabernacle Church a bad name? How about we start to give the Lukinovich family a bad name? At work, on the road, in line, at a family event. You know what, what's so sad and scary about that is as God is trying to be the light of the world through you, but you're shining something different. You're combating him. Not only are you withholding him from being able to come through you, but you're shining something that he's got to fix, that he died to get rid of in your life. But when we're so com committed to our own self and being how we feel like being in every moment, we're literally fighting against God, trying to get through to people. God's trying to shine himself to your neighbor. God's trying to shine himself to your loved one. But you, you're getting in the way. You're fighting against him by being your own way. Think about how critical this is. Remember what I opened up with? How critical this message is? That it can make or break you as a Christian? That it can make or break this church. If we're not faithful to properly shine Jesus to this world, he'll shut this thing down. And I'm going to put somebody here who will properly shine to this world. If they're going to wear my name, I'm going to make sure they're doing it right.
That's actually part of the calling of the leadership of a church is to make sure this is being done correctly. Because if it's not, then we're the ones to be judged. More strictly, by the way, because we were given so much responsibility and trust. But everybody's been given that. When he gave you that blood from his son, you were entrusted with something. You were entrusted with a calling and a mandate to, to shine this to those around you accurately. Not what you want to shine. Who's in charge here? What he wants to shine. Another thing we get twisted on is we get so caught up in the quantity that we overlook the quality. We get all excited about gifts and abilities, especially in charismatic circles. We all about the gifts. We all about the presence. We all about the sh bam. Let's get these people saved, people wiped out. This is amazing. And we get so caught up on the gifts that we overlook the fruit of the spirit. We talked about that in the 72, huh, Nick? We, we hit on that. We hit on that pretty hard. I actually said, I would rather have all of the fruit of the Spirit and not a single gift of the Spirit than have all of the gifts of the Spirit and no fruit of the Spirit. That fruit represents the character and the nature of God Almighty. His love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. If you'll just do that and not do anything else, you won't break a single law. You'll represent the God to the world, and people will come to know him if that's all you did, without a single word even. Because light isn't just, let me correct myself, light isn't heard, it's seen. We can talk the talk. We can have knowledge. I can read the Bible and quote it to you and all of these things. But without love, what does the Bible say I am? A clanging symbol. I didn't, I'm not going to read that passage here, but go read the rest of 1 Corinthians 13. It is hard words shared to those who think they're doing so great for God. But without love, they're making a mess of things that God's going to have to come clean up. You see why this is so critical? The world is turned off by people who exercise gifts but lack the fruit of the Spirit. Imagine seeing Billy Graham, right? Imagine Billy Graham so gifted, speaking to millions of people. That man, is, his life has been used to touch millions of people. So gifted. What if you saw him at Chili's disrespecting his waitress? That's disgusting. You'd be outraged. You don't care. How many millions that he won? You see him disrespect one waitress, and you're going to be disgusted with him. That's how the world looks at us. When we lack the fruit and the character of Christ. Especially when we go around telling people what they should and shouldn't be doing. You want to make some enemies real quick? Go tell a bunch of people what they should or should be doing, and then go act like a fool. You're not helping people come to Christ. When we do that, we're hurting people coming to Christ because we're giving God a bad name. We're sitting there telling them we went to church Sunday and it was the presence and we got the, this word, prophetic word came out and it spoke right to me and then somebody got healed. But then you demand your own way when they're trying to do something and no, it's going to be this way. Well, what happened to love does not demand its own way. Ah, I'm so, listen, I'm talking to myself. I have to deal with all this myself. I had a four-hour drive on the way home from Alexandria last night. Alexandria last night in the rain. That's why it was four hours and not like three and a half. And I got a car full of kids. And they're fighting and mom, 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 every two seconds. I even told Rachel, every 30 seconds, every 30 seconds. I can't even have a conversation. I'm just trying to say words. I can't even say words. And then I got real aggravated when I found out that LSU just is terrible. Let's not talk about that. I am so sorry for you if you're a sports fan in Louisiana. I am so sorry for you. We're going to pray for you after service because we just need deliverance 
if that's affecting your emotions like it affects mine, thank you, Jesus. I've come a long way. But the Pelicans are terrible. The Saints are terrible. And LSU is terrible. It's terrible. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We have hope in Christ. Oh, my goodness. But how did I go there? Oh, I have to be patient. I have to be patient with my children, with my family. I got to be patient in all different circumstances. I'm not walking around on a cloud of Holy Ghost and just touching people. And no, I have to exercise all these things myself. And I was doing a decent job, I think. On that ride home, I had to be reminded, like, I have to exhibit God to these children. And he's patient. So I'm not saying that we don't ever fall short. We're always going to fall short. But because of the commitment in our heart and our desire to properly shine his light, I'm going to repent if I get it wrong. We're going to get it right. Even if it's a big, fat piece of humble pie that I have to eat that says, Daddy was wrong. You saw the way I acted? That is not right. It is not okay. And this is what we're going to do to make it right. That's how you do it. And when you do that, guess what you're doing? You're shining the light of Jesus Christ to your children when you apologize. That's sometimes the biggest, greatest miracles on planet Earth is when people apologize and try to make it right. And when people see that, they're like, oh, my goodness. There is a God. There really is a God. There's no way he would do that, especially the oldly that we used to know. Come on, family. Come on. Wow, she is so kind. Usually she would have flew off the rails over that situation, but there is a God. Maybe this church stuff is real after all. They've been inviting me to church. You know what? I might just need to go check it out because that's a miracle. We got to humble ourselves. We got to allow him to come in and form his likeness in us. That's what following Jesus is all about, imitating him. But it's a lifelong process. You'll never perfectly imitate God, but we have the desire to do that. We're on the journey to do that. You're already a success if you're on the journey doing it. Give yourself a pat on the back and praise the Lord that I am a work in progress. But don't settle for that. That's the problem. When we settle for it and we're like, this is okay, but you don't know what they did. And I'm going to hold this against them because you don't understand the story and all this stuff. No, 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 no. That is not okay. It's never okay. Even with my neighbor, y'all. We didn't know him a thing. It was so bad. I had his landlord come and sit in my dining room table to say, what are we going to do about this? And he said he knew it was a problem. And he had to correct his tenant. We didn't owe him anything. We didn't mistreat him, but we were never, ever allowed to mistreat him. We were never allowed as accountable by God, as accountable to God, to act anything less than what God would treat him. We can't overlook this. This is the most important thing than anything that you do on this earth is properly representing Christ to those around you. As we prepare to leave today, I want you to remember this, that without his authentic love through you, that you are not shining his light. It's, it's got to be authentic. If not, you could put on a good show, but guess what? You're going to know the difference. Those the closest to you will know the difference. They'll know if it's authentic or not. That's why that family piece is so important. It doesn't matter if we're right. It doesn't matter if we're gifted. It doesn't matter if we're bold and courageous. It doesn't even matter if people all around us praise us for all the wonderful things that we do. We have to have God's love in us. That is the greatest. 1 Corinthians 13 says love is the greatest. So as we leave today, 
remember that it's God's love in you that is the greatest. That's the greatest thing that you have to offer this world. It's the greatest thing that you have to offer your children. It's the greatest thing that you have to offer your neighbors, your co-workers, your family members, those that you want to see come to Christ. God's love represented in you is the greatest thing you can do for them. But we got to know what it looks like. What does it look like? It's patient, it's kind, it's gentle, it's all these things. And you know what? This, is, this gets me excited. Just like my neighbor, Jesus himself was able to reach him when all I did was show him Jesus. Somebody I thought would never get reached. There was no amount of words, no amount of right words, wrong words that I could say to him that would have ever made a difference. I had to show him what Jesus looked like. Amen. Only a humble heart can receive this light. Jesus said, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your whole body. It's not on your screen. But when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. That healthy eye is that humility. That healthy eye is that humble heart. That broken and contrite heart. That's saying, enough of me, God, all of you. That's that healthy eye that can receive the light. When you receive God's life, your whole body is filled with light. Your whole life is filled with light. But Jesus said, when your eye is unhealthy, what does an unhealthy eye look like? It can't see. It's hard. It's against God. It doesn't want that light. There's barriers. There's protections. I'm going to hold on to mine. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. Everybody close your eyes for a moment. Your whole body just filled with darkness. Just like that. A hard heart. A proud heart. Is like a life full of darkness. Closed off to the light of God. There's light all around you, you know. With your eyes closed right now, there's light all around you. The light didn't go anywhere. You closed your eyes. This is how people receive the light of Christ. They open their eyes. Their heart gets pricked. And they realize they need a Savior. I want to finish this last sentence that Jesus said. You don't have to keep your eyes closed, but you can if you'd like. If the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. People think because they're good, they go to church, they believe, they raise their hand in church, that they're good to go. But the truth is, you could be in the worst place that you could be. It's like having stage four cancer and thinking you're as healthy as an ox. You may be in here this morning and that scripture I just read, those words of Jesus makes you feel uncomfortable. The light that you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. But today you can receive God's true light right now through Jesus Christ. In a moment, I'm going to give everybody in here an opportunity, but I want you to think about it. You have to humble yourself. You have to open those eyes, those spiritual eyes. You got to let his light into your life. You got to let his self existent life come into your life and give you his life. But when he comes in, he takes over. He's Lord. He takes over. He, it's his way now or no way. All you have to do is admit that you need him. That's it. You, that's opening your eyes to the light of Christ, is admitting that you need a Savior. Admitting that without him, your life is darkness.
If you're in here this morning and you want God's light to fill your life, this is what I want you to do without hesitation. I want you to raise your hand right where you are, where I can see it. Raise it high where I can see it. Come on. Don't be shy. Lift that hand up high. Come on. High, 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 high. All the way up. We're not shy about Jesus in this room. We want the light of Jesus Christ to flood and fill our life. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray together in a moment, but I don't want to even leave misconceptions out there that because I said a prayer or because I stood in front of people or honestly, because I got baptized that I have the light of Christ in me. If you want the light of Christ, you can get it right now. But it's got to be real. You can't fake it. Jesus said there's going to be those who stand before me on judgment day. They said, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. And what is he going to say? Depart from me. I never knew you. It's my job as a pastor to give you the best chance possible and the best opportunity and the best understanding to authentically let his light come into your life so you can receive eternal life. So let's all pray together. We're going to pray. We're going to receive the light of Christ. But if it's not happening on the inside, it's not happening. That's all I want to make clear. That's it. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And there's no sin in you. So without you, I'm in darkness. I know that I need you. I'm opening my eyes to see your light. I ask you to come in with your light and fill my life and give me life. And Lord, you are Lord. Come and have your way in this life that you saved and help me to represent you and shine this light as accurately as I can. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would y'all stand to your feet with me this morning? We had a bunch of hands go up. But this is this is the real stuff right here. This is the real stuff. This is the real stuff. If you're in here this morning, and you want your life to shine so brightly that it makes the devil's eyes bleed. I want you to come up and join me up here in the front. And I would really like to see this whole church up here with me. I want to fill this altar up right here all around the front. And we're going to sing together. We're going to sing this song that's playing. You can begin to turn that up. And we're going to sing, So Will I, God, that you can have your way in my life. That just like all of creation shines the glory of God, that my life will shine the glory of God to all of those around me. Come on, we're going to sing this out. And look, I want y'all to dig deep this morning. We're going to dig deep this morning. Remember, who is this message for? It's for you. It's for me. Can we turn those lights out? Yeah, just shut them off. Just shut both of them up. There you go. That's good. Come on. Let's get alone with God now. And let's just sing to him with all of our hearts to say, God, so will I. You can shine your light through my life in Jesus' name. Let's turn that up. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Can we get, bring it up a little bit more? 
fill this room. Just fill this room up. Fill this room up. Let's fill this room up with the glory of God. Because guess what? When you open your heart and you let him in, he's coming in. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, come on, come on. We're going to pick it up. This song's going to pick up. We're going to pick up. Can we pull that volume up a little bit more? Jesus. God of your promise, don't speak in vain, no syllable in sea of hope. For once you were spoken, on nature resides, follow the sound of your There it is. Come on. So will I. Come have your way, Lord. Come form yourself inside of every heart in this place. Let there be a deep repentance, a godly sorrow for where we have fallen short, where we have misrepresented you, Lord God. Let us not even say a word, Father, until your character is formed in us. Let us not even do a thing, God, until your love is coming out of us, that's oozing out of us, Father. Let us not even think of an idea to do anything, God, until our love for, for these people is coming out of us, Father. Come on, y'all ready to do this? Y'all ready to do this? Are we going to shine? Are we going to shine like those stars? We got to do it. He's counting on us. This is his plan. Let your light shine. Come on, he'll work with you. He'll work with you. On the hill you created, the light of the world, that lived in darkness to die. He's given you everything you need right on that cross. And as you speak, Come on, let's give it our best. Let's give it our all right now. Everything that you got. Come on, I'm challenging you to do it. One time, come on. Come on, it's beautiful, it's beautiful.
Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you so much. Father, we're so thankful for what you did on the cross. Lord, we don't want it to go. We don't want it to go to waste, Father, not in our life. I don't care what anybody else is doing around me. This cross is going to come and take over my life. You gave your whole life for me, God, and I want to absorb every single ounce of what you have to give. Father, in every secret place, Lord God, I want you to have your way. I want, I want you to be who you want to be in my life, Lord God. And the possibilities are literally endless, just like with my neighbor. We can reach people that we never imagined would ever get born again. But they had to see the real thing. They had to see it. We can't just be content to tell it. We do need to tell it. But more important than saying it is showing it. Because if we say it and we don't show it, then we're just, we're creating the enemies of God. We're pushing people away. Thank you, Father, for those who are here that are faithful, Lord God, that have given you their heart and their life. Lord, I thank you for those that have raised a hand in total honesty and transparency, God, that they need you. Father, I pray as a church that you would help us to raise them up in their faith, Lord God. And all those that are coming. I know we had a light group today. That's okay. I'm, a, I'm totally fine. But I think it was like August through October or so. We had like 11 people give their life to Jesus. You know, we're going to see some things happen in here. I'm just letting you know. But God is going to be authentic. It's not going to be a show. It's going to be the real deal. So as we wind down, as we're winding down this year, it's, it's coming to a close. We're about to get into Thanksgiving and the holidays with Christmas. We have five weeks left of the 72 that meets here on Wednesday nights. The fifth week is Christmas parties. The girls are going to have a party. The guys are going to go axe throwing or something on that fifth night. The kids have a Christmas party. But for the next four weeks, I want to challenge you to come here on Wednesday nights and be a part of what God's doing in this church. And this is key. We're looking strategically ahead to the spring of 2025. We're looking at the tab groups that are going to be launched out of this church into the communities, into the community. And But I want to see as much momentum explode out of this place over the next four weeks in this tab group to set the tone for the new year when we relaunch in, in the spring for tab groups. And the last thing I want to say is, if you didn't know already, my, my parents, the Covington pastors, have decided that they're going to step down as pastors in Covington. There's nothing improper. There's nothing that is wrong. They just feel like their time has ended, that that grace has lifted for them to be in that role at the Covington Church. So I just wanted to bring y'all up to speed on that. So let's just be keeping our Covington campus in prayer. That church is so beautiful. I'm telling you, you know, I can't talk about every single person in a church, in a building, but that church has such a sweet spirit on it. You know, it may not look like a lot on the surface at times, but talk about the character of God in that building. It's there and, and it's here too. But in all of our campuses, God wants to do a lot on the surface. He wants to do a lot in action. But if he doesn't have the character right, it's all for nothing. We can cast out a million demons next year. But if we hear, depart from me, I never knew you, what good is that? But he wants to cast out a million demons through us. And we're going to do it. But we're going to be right when we do it. Amen? Next week, Pastor Carl's going to be bringing the message. I'm super excited about that. And, and 
I will, my, me and my family will be in Covington for one week only. <laughs> we're not, we're not going back to Covington just saying. Um, that was kind of some people's first thoughts when my parents were stepping down. They're like, well, I'm like, no, we're here. This is, that's a wrap. I think God did this timing thing on purpose to get us over here before they do any transitioning in Covington. So um, just be keeping them in prayer. Pastor Carl will be here. I'll be in Covington. But let's, the best we can, we can't make people do what they want to do, but let's pack this house out. Let's be a witness, but let's show them Christ more than anything else. I don't care if you don't tell one person about Jesus. If you're not showing them Jesus, show them Jesus and then tell all of them about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Y'all be blessed. Y'all have a great afternoon. Don't watch the saints. Maybe. I don't know. Cause I